Hi, everybody can hear me, I hope. So let me just reiterate my thanks to Simon for this invitation to speak to you all. This is our penultimate session, our third of four. The good news is um, that we are on schedule in terms of uh, uh, the pacing that I had envisioned for this. Uh, Reisen is, as we discussed at great length last time, a ballad in 12 parts, and we are going to be discussing the third quarter of the uh, of the poem today. And next week, we're going to conclude with the last three or four poems and also um, with uh, our efforts at a summation of uh, what this uh, reading experience has been and what the significance of this poem for Yiddish literature is uh, in, in a larger context. So if I can characterize the structure of our four events, we started very broadly with the significance of Belarus, the significance of uh, 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 what we would call Jewish Lithuania to Yiddish culture. Last time we talked about uh, uh, the significance of Reisen in what we could call a formal sense, uh, what kind of a poem it is, what its historical cues are, where the historical cues are coming from, and what Kulbach invests in this literary form for Yiddish literature. Today we're going to be focusing really on the, uh, uh, at what Simon calls, this is a micro series in the micro structure of the poem itself. We are uh, at the halfway point in the poem and a dramatic, thematic, and what we might call rhythmic structure is now coming into focus. And we're going to focus on those questions today. Next time, we're going to try to sum up and we're going to try to extend our focus back out to the larger picture. Uh, those of you who are taking notes, this is also a nice way of structuring your literary essays. If you ever have homework to do for a literature professor, this is uh, how it is ideally done. So I want to review very, very uh, uh, succinctly what we talked about last time. We talked about the history of the romantic ballad as a literary form. We talked about the ironic, and I made the inevitable and unfortunate pun, the Byronic model for 19th century poetry, uh, for revitalizing and reinvesting in the ballad form for uh, 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 romantic poetry. And um, we got a sense of how, we got a vague inkling of how this poem simultaneously confounds or challenges our expectations of what Yiddish poetry is supposed to do, what Yiddish literature is supposed to refer to, and how this poem at the same time is invoking what we might call Belarusian and Slavic models, which further challenges what a Belarusian national culture uh, uh, might uh, consist of, what it might signify. We're gonna talk a lot more about that next time, a week from today. But for now, I wanna talk a little bit more about the poem itself. So I'm going to uh, engage in a bit of uh, ubiquitous screen sharing. I'm going to read the Yiddish original, and then we're going to read the English translation, magnificently and gratifyingly prepared by the collective at Yiddish Kite Los Angeles, uh, who are present today for these uh, talks. I'm grateful for the translation. I'm grateful for your participation in our conversations. So without further ado, let's look now at our Yiddish version. Now we have a very short poem here, but I think it's, it's, it is structurally very, very significant. Die Wille und der Niemann Beis die Levane se spritt sich in Land wie a silberne Regen, dann hebt sich a steife Gestalt von a Litwin, a Reus von a Niemann und se, und se schwimmt nicht gehört 
von Lilia Atunkela Freu im Ankegen. Zu warfen die Locken, die Nase, mit langer und grünlicher Bremen. Bei sich ihr glitschiger Kerker ein Reus von die Qualias. Es beigt sich ein Rieber der Niemann und nimmt sie ein Rommet. Und tut ihr ein Kusch in die Augen, die Grüne, was leichten von Omit. Und nimmt sie ein Rob auf den Grund in die blue kristallene Solias. Now, as I say, this, this section of the poem is very short, but it is very, very significant. Let's go to the uh, 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 English now. Folg mir gang, follow me to the English version. The Vilja and the Niman. When the moon spatters the earth like a silvery rain, a solid figure of a Lithuanian rises from the Niman, and unheard from the Vilja, a dark lady swims out to him, her hair tousled, wet, her lashes long and mossy, unveiling her smooth body from the waves. Then the Niman bends and embraces her and kisses her eyes so green, which gleam from sadness and takes her ashore to his blue crystal chambers. This section, as many others of the poem are, was translated by Robbie Ad Robert Adler uh, Peckerer. Great job, very, very uh, 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 commendable work. I certainly, I'm not being false modest here. I could not have done it as well as uh, Robert has. So, Yasha uh, Let's talk a little bit about this. Uh, for the brevity of this section, it's nonetheless one of the most important in the whole poem, in, uh, in the whole cycle. The Vilja and the Niman are rivers that cut through Belarus. Many of you know the geography of this as well as I do, even better than I do, but significantly they are what connect Belarus to the surrounding landscape, uh, to Ukraine, to Poland, to specifically Lithuania. The Vilia is the river from which the city of Vilnius, Vilno, Vilna takes its name. And the Niman equally important. So here we're at the convergence of rivers that situate this poem in the natural landscape of Belarus. I talked a little bit about this on uh, in our first session. In the 19th century, the norm was to imagine Yiddish literature taking place in a semi-imaginary landscape, in a semi-fictive landscape. We could talk about place names and we could line them up with places on the map. But for the most part, when Mendel uh, Farem or Sholem Alechem, for example, or some of their more obscure predecessors like Isaac Mayer Dick or Yisrael Axenfeld, when they talk about a shtetl, it is supposed to be recognizable. Oh, that's probably Bardichev. Oh, that's maybe um, Vilna. Uh, oh, that's Zhitomer. And uh, by the time we get to Sholem Aleichem's later work, when there's talk of Yechupetz, we understand that so well to mean Kiev, a place where during the Tsarist era, uh, Jews were not allowed to settle without government permission, that among Ukrainian and Russian Jews, Yechupetz became a nickname for Kiev in the colloquial uh, speech. Peretz, Yud Lamed Peretz, the Polish Yiddish writer, uh, contemporary and rival, and if you want, a frenemy of Sholem Aleichem and of the other more Russian identified Yiddish writers, uh, introduces for Yiddish literature in its uh, broadest significance a habit of situating fictitious works about Eastern Europe in geographically identifiable places. Now for Peretz, we don't just set stories in some town that never was, in some funny name for a fictitious prototypical shtetl like Kazrilivka. Now we set uh, stories in places like Nemerov, uh, in places like Lublin, 
in places like uh, Chenstochov, places that have actual names on actual maps. This is a literary and we might call socio-political cue that Peretz is deriving specifically from Polish literature written by Poles, written by Polish people. And what it signifies, what it tells us is that Peretz following his Polish language counterparts is laying claim to a cultural and political map. This was so important for Polish writers in the 19th century because after all, in the 19th century from 1795 until 1918, there was no Poland. And the imperial powers that had divided Poland uh, increasingly tried to erase the political memory of Polish territory uh, uh, from the map. Um, Peretz following the Polish uh, 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 literary counterparts is trying to lay claim to a Jewish, to a Yiddish cultural geography. What we talked about last time, when we talked about the concept of land kentenish, when we talked about the primarily but not exclusively Bundist concept of doakai, hereness, presentness in the land, the doctrine of Yiddish cultural nationalism, that where Jews live is now their homeland. I had the great privilege of uh, making the acquaintance of Yitzhak Luden, one of the last representatives of the Bund in the world a lifelong Bundist journalist, a fabulous Yiddishist, a great storyteller, a wonderful personality. And I was so grateful to have made his acquaintance uh, several years before his death. And one of my friends asked him, uh, Reb Yitzhak, Herr Luden, how can you be a Bundist living in Tel Aviv? The ultimate antithesis of the diasporic nationalism that the Bund preached. Yitzhak Luden bummed a cigarette from somebody and he said, Doakite, right? You know, where I am now, that's where I preach the Bund. So Kulbach is inheriting a cultural and political strategy from writers like uh, uh, Peretz and from ideologues like, he was much younger than Moshe Kohlbach, but nonetheless part of a larger ideological movement that precedes him, like Yitzhak Luden, like the Bund, saying this spot where the Vilya meets the Niman, this is Jewish geography. And yet, let's look at the content of the poem. What does this Jewish geography signify? When the moon spatters the earth like a silvery rain, a solid figure of a Lithuanian rises from the Niman. If we go back to the original, the word there is not, as we would expect from Yiddish, a Litvak, a Lithuanian Jew, broadly defined, but a Litvin, a non-Jewish Lithuanian, who rises from the Niman. So who is this Lithuanian? What is he doing in this poem? When we reflect on the radical paucity of non-Jewish presence in the Yiddish literature of the 19th century, and I stress the 19th century because Kohlbach is writing this poem in 1922. We are certainly not far removed from the norms and the conventions and the habits of 19th century Jewish literature. We can say for the purpose of historical reckoning uh, with the imprecision that makes us good literary critics, the 19th century for all intents and purposes in Yiddish literature really only begins to end in 1905. 
we really want to be comprehensive. 19th century in Yiddish literature really only comes to an end in 1914. Kolbach is writing in 1922. Where I'm going with this is in uh, Yiddish literature of the 19th century, there were very few non-Jewish references. Certainly not an anthropologically accurate estimate of the role of non-Jews in the daily life of the Eastern European shtetl. Why? Well, according to my own professor, Dan Miron, this is also a kind of proto-cultural nationalism. I don't mean the nationalism of Zionism or of the Bund, but of ideas that would eventually give life, would eventually animate the ideologies of these later movements, these later developments. And that is, we are fundamentally in the diaspora. The shtetl is not just where we live or even how we live. The shtetl being defined as that Jewish microcosm, that Jewish infrastructure that regulates and determines everyday life for the Jews who reside there. The shtetl is not just where we live and how we live. It is also, in a sense, a representation simultaneously, two ideas at one time, so... This is complicated, but it's necessary to uh, uh, keep these in our head uh, uh, all at once. So that the shtetl stands for, stands in the place of our primordial homeland, which is not just the land of Israel, but really the concept of Zion itself. Our primordial home is represented by the shtetl. But at the same time, two ideas, remember, at the same time, the shtetl is the measure of how far away we are in actuality from our ideal, from Zion, which is to say, and again, this is a crude paraphrase of my professor Miron's writing, the shtetl is both a miniature version of Jerusalem, of Zion, and a parody of Zion at the same time. Because remember, 19th century Yiddish literature is almost exclusively, and exclusively insofar as we're talking about the Yiddish literature that we want to be reading, almost exclusively a satirical, a parodic literature. So for that reason, 19th century Yiddish literature habitually omitted references to the non-Jewish world because it upset that connection, that embittered and satirical connection of the shtetl to the fallen ideal of an autonomous and empowered Jewish past. Now, in the 20th century, now after 1914, now in 1922, we begin to acknowledge the anthropological fact that Jews were always living among and around and in contact with non-Jews. Let me return to this question. Who is the Lithuanian rising from the Niman? I think the question is meant to remain in ambiguity. However, the next line proves fundamental to the subsequent development of the poem, as I will uh, uh, try to explain in the next few minutes. And unheard from the villa, a dark lady swims out to him, her hair tousled, wet, her lashes long and mossy, unveiling her smooth body from the waves. Then the Neman bends and embraces her and kisses her eyes so green, which gleam from sadness and takes her ashore to his blue 
crystal chambers. This is the language of folklore. This is the language of fairy tale. This is the language of mythology. And it's a specifically Slavic type of mythology that's being uh, invoked. How many of you are familiar with the Czech composer Antonín Dvořák? If you're not familiar with him, after the lecture, no need to rush, it'll be there in the next hour or so. Uh, go and download as much Dvořák music as you can, because he's really one of the great composers of the 19th century. And there is a parallel to be constructed. It's a complicated parallel, and we're not going to spend a lot of time focusing on it in these sessions. But it's nonetheless a parallel that needs to be constructed about the emergence of nationalism in Eastern European music and the emergence of a national identity among Eastern European Jews at the same time. So Dvorak wrote a lot of operas. I don't think any of them are really performed that frequently except for one. It is a, an opera called Rusalka, which is about a pan-Slavic mythological figure of the water nymph. There are also creatures, water creatures that are half animal, half female human uh, throughout world mythology. Uh, Mamiwata in Western African mythology, very interesting figure. Mermaids from what we would call Anglophone legend. Um, Greek mythology is full of these figures as well. The whole notion of nymph suggests a conjunction of water with nighttime with female sexuality. There are lots of morbid ideas about the relationship of uh, women and demons and uh, nighttime and Jewish mythology and Christian mythology all over the world mythology. Women belong to the night. Men belong to the day. That is one of the recurring motifs in a kind of global mythological understanding. This woman in this poem is figured mythologically as a Slavic water nymph. She is at one with the nighttime, with the river, with the banks of the river that uh, bring her ashore in their embrace. She is the river. We see this idea reiterated in uh, Joyce's writing um, a few years later, particularly in Finnegan's Wake. This, does not, this is not meant to suggest that I understand Finnegan's Wake, but I get that motif in the uh, few times that I've tried to read, uh, read it. Again, subject of another lecture, not this series. But this idea is introduced to us mythologically. It is going to become increasingly important thematically as the poem uh, develops. And note here, we're at poem number five in a 12 uh, poem cycle, which is to say we are reaching the halfway point. The encounter with the water nymph in mythological terms cuts the poem in half. Let's hold this thought and let's see what comes next. <laughs> so Isabel notes that Dvorak was her first love as a musical autodidact coming from Soviet Lithuania. Uh, accident or was it natural? Well, Culture is never nat natural, is it, right? Culture is always something that people choose and create for themselves out of the materials that are available for them. Let's marinate on this subject as we turn to the sixth poem in our cycle. I've stopped sharing and I'll call up the next poem now, but we're going to do this via the PDF uh, uh, of the Yiddish. This is a longer poem and it's not easy to read, but let's see what we can do with it. Der Vetter Avram Paschet die Pferd. Bei Nacht ist der Vetter Avram gewen auf der Wachte. 
Das Pelzele hat er gehabt und die Torbe zum Essen. Vom Feierl Glu, wie er Korch ist auf Rom gesessen. Und sie haben gestartet von ihm nur die Beiner die Halter. Also hat der Vetter Avram die Pferde auf der Lanke gefittert. Gepentete haben sie schwer auf ein Groß zugesprungen. Die Schein von Levano hat weich auf die Schapes gezittert. Und weit in vernäppelten Feld hat der Niemann geklungen. Das trockene Feuer hat sich an Keuches geloschen. Also wie in Schlaf ist Avram benommen gesessen. A Bäum in a Bäum hat in dunkler Licht sich gegossen. Und es hat sich gehört, wie das Gras wird gezuppt und gepressen. Und es hat sich gehört, auf den Himmel es rieren sich Sterren. Er reichle tuliert sie ein, wie er warme Niggen. Er zittrige Netz hat vernommen dem Himmel dem Lärm. Und sie schwimmen dort fischelig, finkeln und wiegen sich wiegen. Es hat sich auf Rom das Panem a Ruf ausgezeugen. Die kalte Levone geht um in a Rod in a Geller. Und siebzehn sternlich Sinnen gekommen zu fliegen. Es zittert ein Stern, ein Greener von allem in Heller. Nur plötzlich das Sterndel hat sich gegeben a Zappel. A flieh dann getan in einem blühen Gewebe von die Strahlen. A soi wie a Funk flieht a Reus von a blühen Schwarz Apfel, von der blauen Schwarz Apfel. In Mochiken Wald ist der Stern heruntergefallen. Avram hat etwas a Holm a Weiten verstanden. Der, Fink, der Finklener Blue hat die Gegend die ganze Baschotten. Und dann mit der Sifs ist der Vetter von Dreherd aufgestanden. Und still zu die warme Klatsches er weg in dem Schatten. Er hat sich also bei die Pferde in der Finster gepaaret. A Hals auf a Hals haben alle geätet, verschlafen. Das Licht von der Seite hat auf einem Pferd angetroffen. Und es hat sich von ihm nur die Plätze gesehen, euch gemacht. Das Wintel von Schapes ist dunkel zusammengegossen geworden. Vermattert in streuendem Beidel herein in der, ist der Vetter. A Toppel hat matt in der Finster gescheint mit die Blätter. Und weit ist verglivert in Strahlen gelegen dem, der Korn. Still ist Avram auf der Erde in dem Beidel gelegen. Gecholmt von der Voll, geschmeichelt zu sich und geschwiegen. A Reus ist Pamelech in Bankschaft sein Herz von die Brägen. Und es hat sich der Vetter gar plötzlich zertraut. In a niggen. Bis die Schönste in dem Dorf, Nastasia, sei. Se quält der Gersten und gebärdelt ist der Haber. Die Gemäusechsen in Nepal finkeln von dem Toy. Herr sich ein, Herr sich ein. In die Wälder, die Jodlove geht itzt um verholend. In Levone Schein. Der Moch bewachsener, der Borwisser baldover. Komm a Reus in breiten Feld, wenn alle Feiglen schlafen. Und nur die Qualen sennen auf. Dein Tate liegt vermattert von der Arbeit auf den Scheier. 
Svet wissen nur von dem die alte Riabnir in Heich. Und nur das Winterle, was, was nächtigt in die Eier, bis die Schänste in dem Dorf, Nastasia. So let's see what it looks like in English. Uncle Avram pastures the horses. At night, Uncle Avram looked after the horses. He had food in his sack and was wrapped in a sheepskin, from which only his legs showed stretched toward the fire, beside which he sat like a stump and a silent. That was the way that he pastured the horses. They, impeded by hobbles, clumped through the meadow, where the shimmering moonlight touched the mares gently, and the fog-shrouded Nima distantly sounded. When his dry little fire winked out, exhausted, Avram sat like a sleeper, engrossed in the silence. As tree into tree merged in the shadows, and what could be heard was the grass being cropped and devoured. And what could be heard were the stars in the sky now in motion, as if smoke and a wisp had enclosed them in music, and the sky that was empty now gleamed in a network of light in which, in which fish were gleaming and bobbing. Avram tilted his face toward the heavens, where the cold yellow disk of the moon was seen wheeling. There, suddenly, 17 stars flew together, one of them green, the one that shone brightest. As from a blue eye a spark might go darting, so the star, all at once as if seized by a spasm, plunged from the sky toward the network of light, then fell to the earth to a moss-covered thicket. Avram felt something distant and dreamlike and glittering blue that touched the whole region. Sighing, he stood and turned his attention to the warm mares where they stood in the shadows. There for a while he worked with the horses where neck over neck they stood heavily breathing. Sometimes the light slanted and touched a horse briefly and revealed for a moment its work-weary shoulder. The cluster of mares formed a pool in the shadows. Tired, my uncle crept back to his straw hut, while the leaves of the poplar shone dim in the darkness and wheat in the distance trembled in moonlight. On the floor of the hut, my uncle lay dreaming. Of his village, he smiled to himself and was silent. Then slowly his heart overflowed with a longing, and Avram, my uncle, was suddenly singing. You are the loveliest one in the village, Nastasia. See, the barley is pleased, the oat is bearded, the swamp is gleaming with moisture. Listen, listen. In the forest, the fir tree moves like a dreamer in moonlight, covered with moss, a barefooted spirit. Come to the fields while the birds are still sleeping while only the brooks are awake and your father lies in the barn, worn out by his day's work. No one will know but the ash tree that grows in the courtyard and the night breeze that naps in the reeds. You are the loveliest one in the village, Nastasia. Wiping the tears from his eyes with his coat sleeve, Avram heard how the dream-enclosed district lay silent, while a heart bade farewell to a heart in the darkness. So there's a lot going on here. There's a lot that we don't expect from Yiddish literature of the 19th century happening here. Uncle Avram pastures his horses. I want to suggest very strongly, I want to urge you to consider the idea that the Lithuanian who was referenced in the previous poem is actually Uncle Avram himself. That at this moment, it is as if there is no difference between Jews and non-Jews. And why that is important is because the difference that governs the lives of Jews against non-Jews is about to evaporate. And this is going to have extraordinary significance for the poem as a whole.
At night, Uncle Avram looked after the horses. He had found food in a sack and was wrapped in a sheepskin from which only his legs showed stretched toward the fire, beside which he sat like a stump and as silent. That was the way he pastured the horses. They, impeded by hobbles, clumped through the meadow where the shimmering moonlight touched the mares gently and the fog-shrouded Niman distantly sounded. When his dry little fire winked out, exhausted, Avram sat like a sleeper engrossed in the silence as tree into tree merged in the shadows and what could be heard was the grass being cropped and devoured. At that moment of absolute night, absolute darkness where even the fire is unable to remain awake, Avram is half awake, half asleep. This is the time of dreams. This is the moment where mythology intersects with everyday life. And this is the moment where a merger of humans and civilization with nature becomes most possible, is most fraught, and potentially poses the greatest danger. And what could be heard were the stars in the sky now in motion as if smoke and a wisp had enclosed them in music. And the sky that was empty now gleamed in a network of light in which fish were gleaming and bobbling. Again, I want to reiterate this notion of the nighttime merging with the water to create an otherworldly presence in the vision, in the presence, in the world that Avram inhabits. Avram tilted his face toward the heavens. Well, there's somebody in the Bible who tilts his face toward the heavens. And it's not Avram. It's somebody that we happen to have read about uh, in the previous Torah portion, uh, uh, last Shabbos. This is a reiteration of Jacob's ladder, where we see a mystical vision being written in the stars. But this vision does not signify the future continuity of Jewish people. It signifies a great rupture where the gold yellow disc of the moon was seen wheeling. There suddenly 17 stars flew together. There are more sons in Uncle Avram's family, in the speaker's grandfather's offspring, than there were in Joseph's dream even. Even one of them green, the one that shone brightest. Green is the color of the water nymph. Green is the color of the water itself. Green is Uncle Avram's color. As from a blue eye, remember how Nastasia was uh, uh, led to the blue shore in the previous poem? As from a blue eye, a spark might go darting. So the star, all at once, as if seized by a spasm, the falling star, the falling morning star, the Lucifer star, plunged from the sky toward the network of light, then fell to the earth to a moss-covered thicket. Avram felt something distant and dreamlike and glittering blue that touched the whole region. Sighing, he stood and turned his attention to the warm mares where they stood in the shadows. There for a while he worked with the horses. The language is a little bit more explicit in the original. It's not that he works with the horses, he pairs them where neck over neck they stood heavily breathing. What does it mean to pair two horses? What does it mean that there are not just stallions but mares in this flock? What are these horses doing neck over neck? This is as explicit as Yiddish literature is going to get about the biological functions through which offspring are created. And this is why Uncle Avram have brought the horses out in the deepest night. They stood heavily breathing. Sometimes the light slanted and touched a horse briefly and revealed for a moment its work-weary shoulder. 
The cluster of mares form the pool in the shadows, which is to say a pool, a body of water in which the female horses lay gathered. The horses transmogrify into water nymphs. Tired, my uncle crept back to his straw hut while the leaves of the poplar shone dim in the darkness and wheat in the distance trembled in the moonlight. On the floor of the hut, my uncle lay dreaming. Of his village, he smiled to himself and was silent. Then slowly his heart overflowed with a longing. And Avram, my uncle, was suddenly singing. You are the loveliest one in the village, Nastasia. Now, drawing as we are from a legacy of 19th century Yiddish literature, this allows us to reiterate a fundamental distinction that is always lost, at least in English translation. A shtetl is not a village. It is a small town that bespeaks a Jewish infrastructure. The village lacks that infrastructure. So to say the loveliest one in the village is Nastasia, this is explained by the fact that only a Nastasia, only a non-Jewish woman would be found in the village to begin with. You are the loveliest one in the village, Nastasia. See, the barley is pleased, the oak is bearded. The swamp is gleaming with moisture. Listen, listen. In the forest, the fir tree moves like a dreamer in moonlight. Covered with moss, a barefooted spirit, come to the fields while the birds are still sleeping, while only the brooks are awake and your father lies in the barn, worn out by his day's work. No one will know but the ash tree that grows in the courtyard and the night breeze that naps in the reeds. You are the loveliest one in the village, Nastasia. Wiping the tears from his eyes with his coat sleeve, Avram heard how the dream enclosed district lay silent while a heart bade farewell to a heart in the darkness. There is a very nice serendipity. There is a nice coincidence here. This reference to a heart in the darkness reminds us inevitably of Joseph Conrad, a Polish-born writer, uh, 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 come to English literature. Um, Conrad's heart of darkness is very different from this heart of darkness. So I am remi reminded of Apatashu's uh, 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 um, uh, romance of a horse thief. Um, where I want to go with this is, is to uh, acknowledge the fact that Kulbach is not the only Yiddish writer to write about non-Jewish women, to be certain. Um, but he's among the first, and that's what's uh, significant. Sima reminds us there is also a Lithuanian mythological story uh, that takes place on the Baltic Sea, which fits with the concept that we are discussing. Indeed, uh, there is a common mythology that Baltic cultures, Slavic cultures, and in this case, uh, 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 to a profound extent, a Jewish folk culture share. And Kulbach is drawing from all three in this poem. So what I want to suggest now is the idea that out of mythology comes Eros, that the coincidence of the legendary attributes of the Slavic water nymph and the biological necessity that farmers need their livestock to produce more livestock comes this notion of Uncle Avram's attraction to Nastasia. This is the fundamental motif of the poem as a whole. Or that is to say, if we understand the ballad as a poetic means of recasting the actual, the real, the experience into legend, what distinguishes the ironic ballad, the Byronic ba ballad from traditional pre-modern 
uh, 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 ballads is the need to inscribe the inaccessibility of the legendary in the historical con consciousness of the poet and his or her readers. That what Kohlbach here is uh, describing, what he is recording, what he is imagining is not just the old, sweet, good Belarusian home, but also the inaccessibility of that notion of home for the modern consciousness. He is simultaneously rhapsodizing this moment of unity of Jews with nature, with their surroundings, with their neighbors in Belarus. He is also elegizing the rupture from that unity. And now is the moment where we are going to begin at the exact halfway mark of this poem. We are going to begin to uh, 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 appreciate the rupture itself. Now, Shalom notes that it's ironic that, that this uh, uncle is named Avram and therefore he's linked with the stellar with the star imagery of the patriarchs. That irony, as Shalom has observed, is very much intentional to Kohlbach's understanding of what we can call the origin story of a Jewish Belarus. Let's go on to the next poem. I'm going to share the screen, uh, the Hebrew section now, uh, excuse me, the Yiddish section now. I do know which language I'm studying. Just clarify that. The Yiddish language text we're going to read again. And here we are. The Babasha Alea Sholem is Oiskegangen. As the Babasha the Altichke is Oiskegangen. Haben Fegelach gesungen. Bam mit ihr Zedaka, mit ihr Harz dem Guten. Hat die Welt geklungen. Und als man hat die Babashi Arab gehäuben, hat jeder geschwiegen. Und an der Krechs hat man die gute Altitschke auf der Erde gelassen liegen. Es ist der Seide nu in Stub herumgegangen, a teuter Schaden, weil er der Altitschke. Er hat ihr zugesagt, als er wird früher starben. Und als man hat dem Barminen herabgeführt in Städtel, hat das Dorf getreuert. Niema, niema, justarreue, schliomiche. Und euch der Pop Vasili hat bedeuert. Nur als der Schames hat das Messer Reis gezeigen, zu reißen Krie, dann haben sich zerschrien, nebach, meine Vetters, wie die Rotzchen vor der Klee. Let's see what this means in English. I mean, just, I want to assure you, I have an idea of what it means in English, but we'll all get to, uh, uh, observe in a second. Grandma, may she rest in peace, died. Note if you will, Olia Sholem, uh, may she rest in peace, is one of relatively few words that have an explicit reference to Jewish liturgy in the entire poem. Uh, there are Hebrew derived words throughout the poem. That's the way that Yiddish functions, the way that Yiddish roles, but references to actual Jewish liter liturgy are very few and far between, and they have a general association with death. This has thematic significance, which we should discuss today and at our next session. When grandma, so very old, was near death, little birds were singing with her charity, her generous heart. The world was ringing. And when grandma was carried down, no one made a sound and no one groaned 
when the good old one was laid out upon the ground. Grandpa roamed about the house of broken earthen pot because he, the old one, had promised her to die first would be his lot. And when the corpse was brought to town, the whole village cried, Nima, Nima, Yuz Taroy, Shliomice. And the priest Vasily sympathized. But when the sexton drew his knife to rip their mourning clothes, only then my uncle's poor wretches screamed like murderers at the gallows. Grandma, may she rest in peace, died. When Grandma, so very old, was near death, little birds were singing. Another indication of what is going increasingly to become the rupture of the family's oneness with nature. With her charity, her generous heart, the world was ringing. And when Grandma was carried down, no one made a sound and no one groaned when the good old one was laid upon the ground. First of all, we notice the, the folk-like rhymes that are being inscribed here, that are being ably reproduced in the translation. Second, this notion of a silent death echoes with our understanding of the grandma as having been a kind of magic worker with her fertility, that she could give birth without uttering a sound. It caused her no pain. She was like the mother Eve. Another vaguely Slavic uh, uh, reinterpretation of the biblical creation myth. Here she dies without a sound, either of her body or of her survivors. Only grandpa roams about the house. He is a shattered vessel because he the old one had promised that he would die first. And when the corpse was brought to town, the whole village cried. Indeed, the distinction between shtetl and village is never more significant than it is here, partly to reinscribe a fundamental difference between Jews and non-Jews and in their dependence on the shtetl as an infrastructure. Now remember, the poem is written in 1922, but it definitely uh, commemorates a setting that precedes World War I. It is definitely a 19th century story that is being invoked in this 20th century uh, ironic ballad. Jews could live in the village. This is a sociological and historical fact, but they could only be buried in a shtetl because that's where the Jewish cemetery was. And a Jewish cemetery is one of the institutions that defines the shtetl as a Jewish space. So even the priest is sympathizing with the Jewish family in the village because the priest we deduce is a more familiar figure to these Jewish peasants than the rabbi would be. But the sexton, the shamus, interposes himself to begin the Jewish process of mourning, which commences with the tearing of the garments. And it is only in the tearing of the garments that the, uncle them, the uncles themselves scream over the loss of their mother, but significantly they scream as if they themselves had killed her. Now, this is not literally true, and we know this apparently, but what is significant now is that the uncles appreciate the rupture that has taken place with the death of the grandmother. How have they inflicted this rupture? Well, let's read the next poem. Got a couple of comments in the chat. Sophia notes that a shattered vessel is a Kabbalistic con concept. Indeed it is. I'll just advertise that Kabbalistic references are far more explicit and numerous in the 
prose writing that Kohlbach was writing at the same time from Berlin. Uh, and Vicky points out, shards are put on the eyes of the dead in Jewish burial. Indeed, all of these references resonate with the poem. Let's see what happens in the next section. And either we'll continue reading or maybe we'll open it up to more general discussion because there's a lot happening in the poem right now. It's about to get really, really dramatic or as dramatic as this poem is going to get. Let me go back to the Yiddish, please. Nastasia. Nastasia hat Shavia gekliben beim Zeit von die Stetschkes. A Mozart zu machen am Taschen, ihr Taten dem Alten. Sis reißen gebencht mit der Horrican Shavia, a Kalten. Mit Jodlis wie Pelzen und Robben, wie die Hollewetschkes. Dem Vater in Hand geht Nastasia in Feld eingebeugen. A soi wie a Katschgele. Weiß nit von Schlechts und von Sorgen, die fieselach banetzte von Toi und barreucht von Frimorgen. Sie hat von dem Atem von Dreher par Erchies gesäugen. Dann kommt ihr von Veldo ein Mensch mit a, mit a Hamet an Kegen. Sie hat ihm bekocht von der Weit mit der Hand bei die Eugen. Er kommt aus euch frisch, punkt er wollt in die Wälder gelegen. Verschämt hat Nastasia sich wieder zum Stavia verbeugen. Das kehrt sich Avram erheben von der Wachte beginnen. Gut Morgen, Nastasia, der Kälbele Stille. Gut Morgen. Sie hat sich per Busche hinter die Kustes verborgen. Es wird sie der Vetter der Schwerer nicht können gefinden. Dann hat sich Avram Allahs in die Kustes gegeben. Gehört hat sich weit sein Gelächter von zwischen die Blätter. Du Kälbele meine, wo bist du, mein Kreun und mein Leben? Nastasia hat hinter die Zweigen gequollen von Vetter. Er ist es euch frisch. Punkt er wollt in die Wälder gelegen. A Bräuner zerhitzt mit zerschäuberte Eugen und Locken. Er hat sie gefunden in Groß, halb der Freit, halb der Schrocken. A Hindele schreck sich a Säu in a sonnigen Regen. Hat er sie getan, dann a Chab in die Arms die Breite, der Land ihr a Kusch in dem zitterige Hals dem Verbrennten. Sie hat sich gegeben a Zappel zu ihm a der Freite und still zu seinem Brust sich getuliert als Nenter und Nenter. So let's see what's happening in English. Nastasia. Nastasia was gathering sorrel on the footpaths to make a meal for her father, Antosha. Belarusia is blessed with cold, shaggy sorrel, with fir trees like pelts and ravens like cinders. Bowed, she went through the fields, clutching her apron. She moved like a duckling that knows neither evil nor sorrow. Her feet moistened by dew and tinged by the light of the morning. Her hand at her eyes, she watched as, she, as he came from a distance out of the woods in his arms, a horse collar. So the night was maybe successful. Her hand at her eyes, she watched as he came from a distance. His step was so lively as if he had slept in the forest. Shyly, Nastasia bent down once again to the sorrel. It was Avram at dawn coming back from tending the horses. Good morning, Nastasia. Timid, sweet lambkin, good morning. Nastasia, embarrassed, tried hiding herself in the bushes, hoping that Avram, my sturdy young uncle, might miss her. But Avram plunged into the thicket and once at once, and his laughter deep in the leaves could be heard at a far distance. Ho, 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 ho. 
Lambkin, my sweet one, my darling, where are you? Hidden in leaves, Nastasia was pleased by my uncle. He looked so lively, as if he had slept in the forest. He was tan and excited. His eyes glowed and his hair was disheveled. He found her at last in the grass, half afraid, half delighted. She was scared, as a pullet might be when sunlight pierces a shower. Then Nastasia was caught in his arms. He embraced her and kissed her tan throat, though she trembled, till, startled by pleasure, she wriggled against him and pressed herself silently to him, closer and closer. We've talked about the biblical resonances of the poem's imagery. This too is biblical uh, imagery, but it's not imagery that describes how the Jewish patriarchs courted their wives, our matriarchs. Very significant to contemplate this. This is how the Jew becomes a peasant in the language and the imagery and the rhetoric of the poem. Nastasia was gathering sorrel. Well, this is a quintessentially Slavic root, quintessentially Slavic food that becomes also a Jewish food. And it's important for those of us who only know these herbs, these uh, uh, plants, these dishes as Jewish dishes to understand that they are a shared cultural inheritance of the Eastern European landscape, the Slavic uh, uh, ethnicities, as well as the Jewish ethnicities. Um, she's gathering sorrel to make a meal for her father and Antosha. Belarus is blessed with cold, shaggy sorrel, with fir trees like pelts and ravens like cinders. Bowed, she went through the fields, clutching her apron. She moved like a duckling that knows neither evil nor sorrow. So observe, at night, Nastasia is a water nymph. She's a mythological creature. She is the blending, the harmony, the inextricability of nightfall with water, with spirit, with human. By day, she looks like a duck. Everything is demythologized, demystified, de disenchanted. She moved like a duckling that knows neither evil nor sorrow. Her feet moistened by dew and tinged by the light of the morning. Her hand at her eyes, she watched as he came from a distance out of the woods in his arms, a horse collar. Not what we would expect of a Jewish young man coming from the synagogue with tefillin and with a uh, prayer shawl. Her hand at her eyes, she watched as he came from a distance. His step was so lively as if he had slept in the forest. Shyly, Nastasia bent once again to the sorrel. It was Avram at dawn, coming back from tending the horses. Good morning, Nastasia, timid, sweet lambkin. Well, the actual word is not lambkin. It's, it's, it's kelbala. It's, you know, little cow. It's calf. It's a little bit more boisterous. It's a little bit less uh, uh, infantilizing or idealizing. Timid little calf, good morning. Nastasia, embarrassed, tried hiding herself in the bushes, but the word again is not exactly hiding. It's actually, she buries herself in the bushes. She tries to conceal herself entirely. She tries to steal herself away in the bushes, hoping that Avram, my sturdy young uncle, might miss her. But Avram plunged into the thicket at once and his laughter deep in the leaves could be heard a far distance. Little cow, my sweet one, my darling, where are you? Hidden in leaves. Again, buried under the leaves, Nastasia was pleased by my uncle. He looked so lively as if he had slept in the forest. Bear in mind how far we are away from the world of the grandmother's funeral. Now there is the open and uh, very peasant-like, almost Borat-like, courtship of Nastasia by Avram. He looks so lively as if he had slept in the forest. Contrast the death of the grandmother, the death of a 
unitary existence of this tribe, at one with nature, but also at one with their Jewishness, with the lively intermingling of the Slavic peasant girl with the uh, Jewish peasant boy. To belong to that harmony now, at this point in the second half of the poem, means to be, to belong to death. To live in this moment, to live in this landscape now, as Uncle Avram demonstrates to us for the purpose of the poem, means to leave a world of Jewishness as it was traditionally understood behind. He looks so lively as if he had slept in the forest, as if he had slept with the forest, as if he is one with the land. His liveliness contrasts with any marker of his Jewishness. He was tanned and excited. His eyes glowed and his hair was disheveled. He found her at last in the grass, half afraid, half delighted. She was scared, as a pullet might be when sunlight pierces a shower, when two worlds in intermingle the sunshine and the rain and the rain shower then nastasia was caught in his arms he embraced her and kissed her tan throat though she trembled till startled by pleasure she wriggled against him and pressed herself silently to him closer and closer I'm gonna stop the share The grandmother was also compared to a duck. It's true. She was compared to a duck. She was compared to a chicken. That she's compared to a duck that lays uh, ducklings uh, without a cease. Here, it's a different kind of duck. Is is what I would say. Suggest that the continuities uh, 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 that the continuities. Um, underscore the ruptures. Um, Isabel notes correctly that people of dif different tribes had slept together before the era of Borat. Um, and she uh, uh, recalls a Yiddish folk song called Margarita, which is actually the description of a rape. And we can infer in that song that it's maybe a non-Jewish, non-consensual uh, coupling with a Jewish woman. Here is a consensual coupling of a Jewish man with a non-Jewish woman. And what's significant about this in Yiddish literature and in Jewish literature of the 19th century generally, by which I mean Yiddish and Hebrew literature, we see couplings of, um, Jewish men with non-Jewish women, it's always low comedy. It's always a Jewish guy that we're better off letting him go to the Christians, letting him go to the non-Jews. It's, it's farce. We see occasionally a Jewish woman, a Jewish girl, going with a non-Jewish uh, 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 partner. It is um, always the stuff of melodrama. Note the terms I'm using. Farce, when a Jewish guy goes with a non-Jewish girl. Melodrama, when a Jewish girl goes with a non-Jewish boy. Farce and melodrama are very connected. Farce and melodrama have, have more in common with one another than either farce has with comedy or melodrama has with tragedy. This is a subject for a longer lecture. But what's remarkable here in 1922 is that this pairing of a non-Jewish woman with a Jewish man with the significance in halachic terms that under no circumstances could their children be considered Jewish according to halachic tradition. This passes over with neither farce nor with melodrama. This, I want to suggest, is a first in Yiddish literature, and it is one of the defining moments that differentiates 20th century Jewish writing from 19th century Jewish writing. Tamara reminds us that Avram is mythologized in this poem 
while Nastasia is of this world, a reversal from their earlier interaction. So Bela points out, uh, for example, Tevye's daughter, Havala. Exactly. When Havala marries Fedke, that is not the stuff of low comedy. That is the stuff of melodrama. It is a melodrama that is accentuated in Sholem Aleichem's own incompletely successful dramatization of the story for the stage. Uh, but it is a melodrama that though felt and experienced by the reader is nonetheless interrogated, questioned, uh, dramatized in a much more philosophically rich fashion in the original Tevye monologue that Shalom Aleichem writes to describe the incident. This is again a much longer series of lectures about what Shalom Aleichem is doing with uh, intermarriage, with the with the marriage of a Jewish woman with a non-Jewish man in his Tevye cycle and how that gets interpreted, uh, repurposed, recontextualized radically from Sholem Aleichem's own dramatic uh, uh, adaptation to the um, film version uh, that was made in Yiddish in 1939 to Fiddler on the Roof in the 1960s. Again, a whole different subject. Um, we have come to a, to the end of the third movement of what I am describing as a four movement cycle, uh, in this ballad. We have read up to the coupling of Avram with, um, Nastasia which is the dramatic and the erotic climax of the poem as a whole. I wanna save the last uh, three or four poems for next time. Um, it's really a separate, as, I just, as, as I'm describing it, using musical terminology that was always important to the 19th century repurposing reinvestment in the ballad form. Uh, the next poem is the start of a different movement for this cycle. So I want to suggest now that we continue a discussion that's been ongoing through my close reading and try to um, open this up to other people. Um, let's talk. Questions, comments, more general reactions to the sections that we've read today with the understanding we have one more lecture next week and we'll talk about the rest of the poem then. I can unmute you if you have a question or you can type your question into chat and I can read it for everybody. So Simon is suggesting maybe this section is a reversal of a traditional Jewish suspicion of nature as pagan and ending in becoming uh, like the Gentiles. I would say that the poem as a whole is revising our understanding of what Jewish literature can be and how Jews can interact with uh nature and with the non-Jewish world. And yet, I think that what's important, and this is the way that we understand mythology as it intersects and as it contradicts with literature as a civilizational practice. Mythology is so rich. It is so, um, it is so complicated because it signifies how two things that contradict one another can coincide in the world of the imagination. If we return, for example, to the world of Freud, and Freud is maybe more useful now as a literary theorist than he is as a psychoanalytical practitioner. If we uh, turn to the world of Freud, the reason why Freud draws on mythology so much is because in mythology, antithetical conditions can coexist as they are not permitted to coexist in our conscious 
ego formulated uh, uh, psyche, which is to say in the unconscious, according to Freud, one can, you can love your father and desire your father's death at the same time. That's what the Oedipal complex signifies. It is not the literal desire for the death of the father. It is an unconscious mythological reversion to a competition between the father and the son for the mother's attention. So this is, um, this is how Freud utilizes mythology. Contradictions can coexist in the mythical world but they don't coexist in the rational world. And literature is a constant negotiation of the mythological with the logical, which is to say what Kohlbach is doing, and this is to answer directly to Simon's question, what Kohlbach is doing is he is holding out the notion of a mythological union of Jews with nature, which implies a mythological unity of Jews with non-Jews, a, uh, a, a, a unity with the landscape and with the land, with the nation of Belarus, and he's withdrawing that unity at the same time. It is and it isn't. It existed, but it existed in a past that becomes primordial when we recognize that it belongs to the realm of the dead. So where did Kulbach acquire his mythological knowledge education to incorporate this concept in the poem? I think that Kulbach uh, acquired this from a knowledge of um, Belarusian folklore, Slavic folklore generally, uh, from reading Russian literature, from reading Belarusian literature, from understanding that it is the role and it is the potential, <coughs> the potential of a Yiddish poet, not just to speak to a Jewish audience, but potentially to a Slavic, to a non-Jewish audience as well. And this is a mantle, a poetic mantle that Kulbach inherits from Leib Naidus, who we talked about uh, in the first session, was a, a direct influence on Kohlbach the poet. But I want to stress, Kohlbach the poet, well, I mean, for my money, he's, you know, he's a, he's a richer, more complicated, more complex poet because he's willing to, to inhabit the contradictions more fully. So as Isabel notes, if you live in Lithuania, Lithuanian mythology is everywhere, in the fields, in the woods, in the bushes. Indeed, this is true. If you live in Lithuania, Lithuanian mythology is everywhere. But if we read prior Lithuanian Yiddish literature, we don't see references as readily as we do in this poem to Lithuanian, to Belarusian, to Baltic, and to Slavic folklore and mythology. It is Kulbach who is harnessing this mythological legacy as being equally significant to the underpinnings of Yiddish poetry as the Hebrew Bible itself is. So Shalom is pointing out appropriation of Gentile and pagan folklore and mythology here is related to a trends other than Jewish literature in the period. Chanachovsky, Margolin, and many others. Yehoash translating the Hiawatha, of which I hear echoes here, also fits with romanticism, connection to nature, nationalism, refashioning of a new Jewish masculinity, etc. I agree with this 100%. Um, Kulbach is participating in a larger phenomenon of Jewish neo-romanticism. I would add to uh, the figures uh, 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 a reference here, Chanakovsky in Hebrew poetry, for example, uh, translating 
Pushkin from Russian into Hebrew, Anna Margolin, a great Yiddish poet who directly derives from the Russian lyrical uh, tradition, Yehoash translating American literature into Yiddish, so too is Kolbach participating in the same moment uh, 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 in a broader neo-romantic uh, 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 phenomenon. Uh, he is among the first, but he's not the only one. Simon asks, am I right that the Vilya and Niman are coming together in Kovna and Kaunas? Is the mythology of Raisin and Lithuania a common one for Kolba? Yes, both rivers merge in Kovno. Kovno, which is in, um, it's in Lithuania, right? Both the Vilya and Niman are more symbolic than real here. Um, indeed, they are symbolic, but they are symbolic of a Belarusian past. They are symbolic, and this is fundamental, and we're going to get there next time. I promise, I promise, I promise. They are symbolic of the union of Lithuania with Poland in the Middle Ages, a union of Baltic culture and Slavic culture that brought about Eastern European Jewish culture itself. We're going to talk about this at much greater length next time because it is fundamental to the conclusion of the poem, the nearly ecstatic conclusion of the poem. So real cliffhanger here. I'm doing this on purpose. Uh, uh, we're, going to, uh, we're going to get to this point uh, uh, next time, but you're beginning to understand the components that constitute uh, this synthesis. It is a synthesis of geography with mythology. It is a synthesis of history with nature. It is a synthesis of non-Jewish Eastern European culture with Jewish civilization, both in its Eastern European context and in its larger mythological uh, boundaries stretching back to Tanakh, to the Pentateuch, to the Torah itself. These are the frames, the multiple intersecting and interacting frames of reference through which Kulbach uh, uh, constructs his poem. And where I want to go with this is much of this poem seems on first reading deceptively simple. It seems like someone imitating a folk singer. And yet what I want to urge you to recognize is within the uh, language and the rhetoric of the poem, there is just as much complexity. There are just as many frames of reference. There is just as much historical and mythological sophistication in this poem as there are in Kulbach's other writings from the same period, which are much more extravagantly complicated in their frames of reference. But also this neo-romantic embedding and embodiment of the Yiddish poetic figure with the Eastern uh, European surroundings is just as complex as what we would see in uh, a contemporaneously canonical poetic figure, like in the English tradition, someone like William Butler Yeats. So I would say that it's not just that we should be looking at Yehoash's translation of the Hiawatha, which is a pristinely romantic uh, effort at creating an American vernacular epic poem, but we should be looking at the symbolist play of references in, po in poets like Yeats, like T.S. Eliot, like Moshe Leib Halpern in Yiddish, that are really exciting Kulbach 
at one and the same time to invoke a very sophisticated blend of mythological and legendary references and also together with that invocation to conceal the complexity of his references behind the mask of a neo-romantic uh, courtier, uh, chanticleer, minstrel. Are there any other questions, any other comments today? So you've been a you've been a great, great audience. You've been really, really engaged. Uh, your comments are really, really appreciated. Are you thinking of two rivers of Jewish and Belarusian culture? So it, it are the Vilya and the Niman uh, both equally, uh, uh, is one Jewish and the other Belarusian? No, 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 no. They are both and at the same time, they are the mingling of the Baltic with the Slavic with the Jewish. And that mingling, exactly, with the Lithuanian, with the Belarusian, with the Jewish simultaneously, that it is in the blending of the waters of Belarus. It is the Belarusian status situated on the borders between the Baltic and the Slavic that provides it with a model for what Jewish culture in Eastern Europe can be, once was, and shall be again. This is what Kohlbach is invoking. This is what Kohlbach is manipulating. This is what Kohlbach is adapting from his garret in Berlin to write about the world that he has left behind. A world, as we shall see in the fourth section, that he is apparently longing to return to. He mythologizes and dramatizes that return in the next section. So I'm being a very bad lecturer. I'm gonna let you go a couple of minutes early, but I promise you next time we're gonna go two minutes late. So uh, uh, brew your coffee early and I'm looking forward to seeing all of you back again uh, next week. Thank you all.